Good afternoon and welcome to the National Postal Museum. So wonderful to see everybody here today, including our speakers. Um, my name is Allison Wickens, and I'm the Director of Education here at the museum. Um, and I just want to let everybody know that we do have sign language interpretation today. Um, if you um, need that service, just please self-identify and we'll make sure the interpreters stand up next to the podium. Many people are watching this program online as well. You can see we've got the cameras set up. Um, in fact, if there's overflow for the room, we've got the uh, live feed going out on the floor. So our visitors um, who can't come to the full program will be able to see parts of this interview as well. Um, but for that reason, I want to make sure in the question and answer section that you do speak into the microphone because some of the people listening to your questions will be millions of miles away <laughs> and they won't be able to hear your voice. Um, in addition, we will be using wireless mics for that. So if you can make sure you turn off your cell phones um, because those signals may uh, interfere with the wireless microphones, I'd appreciate it. Um, see many new faces today. Um, I also see faces that were here 15 years ago when we celebrated the 25th anniversary of this strike. I welcome you back and I welcome you to attend future programs. We've got calendar of events so you can make sure that you pick up one of those on your way out today. Or you can even just join our mailing list. You'll see there's a sign up sheet in your program to do that. I know that among this crowd there are many, many stories of the 1970 postal strike. And we invite you uh, to contact our museum curator, Nancy Pope. She's joined us here today. Hi, Nancy. Um, contact her if you have memories you'd like to share, or objects or mementos that are relevant to the strike that you want the museum to know about. Um, this is an important area that we're interested in collecting in. Um, and these stories here we'll hear today are part of that, um, the, the curation collection that we're starting. Um, Nancy's contact information is right on your program on the back page. Um, so when you get home, you can think about what, what you'd like to share with her. We also want to hear about your experience just today at today's program. And this program is all so useful. In your program, you also have a, a brief uh, evaluation form. So we want to hear about how you found out about the program um, and what your thoughts about it was. Mr. Uh, Alan Kane is the director of the museum. And he will introduce today's speakers, who um, they'll speak until about 3 PM today. I will ask you to hold your questions until all the speakers have um, given their remarks, and we'll save Q&A for the end of the program. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Alan Kane. Well, thank you, Allison. Uh, let me add my welcome to the Postal Museum. It's a beautiful day to listen to the 40th anniversary of the postal strike. Uh, the museum has three roles in life, and I'd like to just make sure everybody understands we tell the story of the history of the Postal Service, number one. We also t t focus in on, on American culture. We try to use our exhibits and programs around stamp images to highlight American culture. And thirdly, we're the custodian of the National Stamp Collection. That's six million objects, six million objects. They're all in the vault out this door to the right. It's the second largest collection in all the 19 Smithsonian museums, and it's the second most valuable collection uh, in, in the Smithsonian Museum hierarchy. Uh, having said that, it's, um, the, the program today will focus on the 1970 postal strike, and it's amazing to me, it's been 40 years, 40 years since a small wildcat strike in New York City over wages grew into a nationwide action involving over 200,000 employees, 200,000. I was one of them. Just to tell you quickly, uh, my role was, was simple. I was a trainee on tour one in Hicksville. And what I did was I got the counts of all the mail that wasn't processed and delivered throughout the New York region. And in the morning, I called it to some person who I never met. And I said, here are the counts. And that's what I did for basically a week. So I'm proud of having a role in the, in the strike. Not like these guys, but um, I found out I could count and add. I'm amazed. In addition to the wage issues, the long range ramifications of the strike were far greater than just money. It, the dispute helped shape the future business model of the Postal Service and the 1970 legislation creating the new United States Postal Service. And we have three distinguished speakers today 
who worked through the strike period and then played key roles in shaping the postal service of today. Vincent Brado, Bill Burris, and George Gould. In addition, I'd, I'd like to recognize Fred Rolando. Thank you for coming here today. And Bill Young, who's come back from retirement. <laughs> and I, and uh, is Ted Keating here also? I thought Ted was going to join us also. Before I turn the program over to the speakers, I want to give you a little background just to set the stage. The postal work stoppage happened when mail was the primary method of communication. We didn't have a major internet presence. You didn't have email, didn't have online bill payment. The postal service was critical, critical, not only on the communication aspects of the country, but also the economic aspects. Mail volume was growing significantly. Between World War II and the mid-60s, mail grew for first class at 70% and for third class at 180%. A little different than today. So mail was, was growing by leaps and bounds. And the post office department was playing catch up. Not enough employees to work the mail and way behind on developing machinery to process the mail. In fact, in 1966, the Chicago post office was closed for three weeks and it was about 10 million, these guys know better than me probably, 10 million, 10 million pounds of mail on the floor throughout the whole Chicago area. Major problem. So in 1967, President Johnson forms the Capital Commission to suggest changes to the post office department. In 1968, labor was nervous and feared loss of civil service status and their leverage with Congress. Similarly, Congress was nervous because of all the possible loss of the patronage jobs they had to give out each time. So everybody was nervous. However, over the next 15 months, a lot of debate went on, but no action. Then in 1970, a problem happened. Congress voted themselves a 40% pay increase and the postal workers only got 4%. 40% for Congress, 4% for the postal workers. You may not know this, it's interesting, I was looking at it. The starting postal pay in 70, 1970 was $6,176. And after 21 years, 21 years, you rose to $8,442. 6,000 to 8,000. The average family of four in 1970 was making $11,700. See the difference? Really a major problem. The national union leaders were working with Congress and the Nixon administration to try to figure out what to do. But the rank and file, the rank and file workers were very unhappy. And the stage was set for a wildcat strike led by NALC Branch 36 in Manhattan. So while everybody was trying to work it out up here in Washington, similar to today's world, where, you know, back and forth, uh, the, the local folks had enough, and Branch 36 led the, led, started off with the uh, strike. The strike was called illegal, and the administration and national union leaders called for an end. But more workers joined in, and the strike spread to 13 states, and over 200,000 workers were involved. President Nixon called out the National Guard, <coughs> and the strike ended eight days later. In 1970, President Nixon signed the Postal Reorganization Act, the most radical transformation in the post office department in the last 200 years. So that's a little background on what was happening prior to this particular strike. And now we're gonna begin the, uh, the panel discussion with Vince Sombrato, and let me introduce him properly. <coughs> Vince was president of the little over 300,000 member National Association of Letter Carriers. He was a senior member of the AFL-CIO AFL Executive Council, which oversees operations of the 13 million member federation. Mr. Sombrato was elected as NALC president in 1978 after serving as president of Branch 36 in New York City, the largest local in the, in the NALC. And in 1970, he was the leader of the eight-day rank-and-file strike that led to reforms, including the Postal Reorganization Act. 
Yes? All yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I pause for a second because it's where to begin. How does one start to talk about the genesis of a so-called wildcat strike that affected ultimately in excess of 200,000 postal employees? I have to go back a little and reintroduce myself to so many people that are not here anymore that helped a great deal in creating the environment that led to the vote. And in a little while, I'm going to illustrate how fervent the membership was in terms of voting for that strike. First of all, the strike didn't start on March 17th. It actually began on a picket line, or two picket lines, I should say, outside of Bronx GPO in 1968 and in, uh, in front of Grand Central Station the same, same day. While letter carriers were picketing, and why were they picketing? Because Legislation had been up in the hill for pay raises for postal employees for a number of years, and there was really no movement. And there was no foreseeable future in waiting for the legislation to pass that would give us uh, uh, postal uh, wage increases. And so while we picketed, People on the picket line were saying, you know, what are we picketing for? We're better off if we go out on strike. And so that, that sort of thread its way through the, the pickets, both in, in the Bronx and in Manhattan. They were saying that. Well, you know, like sometimes you're all together and you're marching like that. There's a furor's raised. People are excited. And they say things maybe they don't mean. So you, it passed away after the next day. Except that on July 1, 1970, letter carriers and some, I believe, eight or nine clerks walked out of two Bronx post offices, Kingsbridge and Trog's Neck. They walked out. They didn't come to work the next day. So the media got a hold of it, and it was blasted all over the radio and all over the media that letter carriers were not on strike, and postal employees were not on strike in Kingsbridge and, and uh, Frog's Neck. Well, I can't explain the electricity that went through the station I worked in. I worked at Grand Central. There were over 660 carriers that worked in that station. And everybody was asking the same question. If they were not in Kingsbridge and Throg's Neck, when do we go? When are we all going to go? So I asked the shop steward. The shop steward said, Look, I don't know anything about this. I'm going to call up the office. Called up the office. They say, well, wait a minute. We have nothing to do with this. We don't know what the heck's going on. Well, it didn't take a fervent imagination to know that something was amiss here. Carriers and eight or nine clerks would not just go to work one day because they took it upon themselves to do that. There had to be some motivation or somebody that was pushing them. In the end, it came out that our headquarters in Branch 36 had told them that if they went out, that that would be the start of a national strike. And that it, today would it be the Bronx, tomorrow it'll be Manhattan, and then before you know it, it'll be the country. So that was it. Well, in the first 
<laughs> 12 hours of that walk out by King Bridge and Throg's Neck, every letter carrier at that station became a hero. They became someone that was a hero. Within 20 hours, they became turncoats. <laughs> after, the, after the initial excitement of the, of the walkout, the headquarters of Branch 36 said, we didn't have anything to do with this. These people are crazy. They did it on their own. Well, you didn't have to be a, a Harvard graduate to know that that was not possible. So a little investigation was necessary. So I started looking into this. And I said, hey, what the heck? There's something wrong here that they would leave these people hanging like this. So, well, what I did was I got a manila envelope. I opened it up. And I wrote a call based on our bylaws for a special meeting to discuss the Kingsbridge and Throgs Neck situation. And when I did that, uh, based on our bylaws, the, the organization was, not, uh, was bound to call a meeting. Now, what happened in between? I said there were eight or nine clerks that went out, too. Bo Billow, who was then the president of the MPU, the MPU had, the, had the good sense to say, well, there's eight clerks, we're going to pay. And the settlement that was made, I must, let me retract them a second. When that happened, naturally, they were all going to be fired because they broke the law and all these employees were going to be fired. Well, a little deal was worked out in Washington where they weren't going to be fired, but they are all going to be suspended for two weeks. And they were allowed to use their vacation <laughs> to pay for the two week suspension. <laughs> well, I thought that was criminal, asking them to pay for their own vacation when they, as I surmised, were instructed to do what they did. So at this meeting, we, mobile, as I said, Mobila was smart enough, he said, we're going to pay our members two-thirds of their salary. They're not going to be able to suffer. They shouldn't suffer. We're going to pay them the two-thirds of the salary. So at, at this meeting, I called them Branch 36, this special meeting. A motion I made was that we pay all the carriers that went out. I think it was about 60-some out of them between Kingsbridge and Throgs Neck, two-thirds of their salary. And what ha happened was there was a big meeting, but the meeting kind of, it was kind of funny. Gus Johnson was then president of Branch 36. He said, well, we're going to vote on this. All that are against paying them stand on this side of the room. All that want to pay them stand on this side of the room. Well, here's what happened. On this side of the room that wanted to pay, there was all people in letter carriers in uniform because our meetings were held after work. And so carriers generally came to work in, uh, to the meeting in uniform. All of them were in uniform. On the other side of the room, everybody was in suits. <laughs> they either were shop stewards, branch officers, or retirees. Now, they said that we knew to, uh, because it was an appropriations, we needed two-thirds of the vote to win. Well, suffice to say, we didn't get the two-thirds. We lost by not too many, but we didn't carry the day. From that day on, I never, I never relented. I said, they will be paid, and we will do something about what's going on in the Postal Service. So from that day on, each meeting, I would bring it up that they should pay them. And each meeting, I would see who the people in that meeting were against what was going on, take their names, form a cadre of people, and start what I called the rank and file. And the rest became history, because in, in January, we finally got them paid. We overwhelmed the administration at that time with the vote that we had. And we also created a, a, a meeting in which a vote was taken that we, at the March meeting that we would make 
a vote on whether we should strike or not. And here's a paper that was distributed. It's interestingly enough. Now, we're talking about a strike. The strike is illegal. The strike, based on the law at that time, anybody that even mentioned the word strike was subject to a five thousand uh, dollar, a ten thousand dollar fine, and five years imprisonment. That was posted in every station. But they also asked us to vote on the condition that if we were not on strike, that we would do it alone in New York City as opposed to doing it nationwide. So we had the choice. Either we were going to be out there by ourselves or we had wait until the rest of the country got in line and was ready to vote. Well, both the national, all the national organizations strike. The only hard time you've heard that word was in a bowling alley. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, at the, at the February meeting, I should say, a motion was made that we have a strike vote in March, and the date was picked March 17th. It was picked that uh, we would hold it at the what was then the labor temple of, of the labor movement in New York, uh, and, uh, and it was supposed to be just a meeting that we would decide to go out on strike or not. Well, when we got to the meeting, First of all, they had what they called security. That security didn't last too long. <laughs> they wouldn't let the people go in, so then they threw them out of the way. People just charged in, opened the doors. And what they had intended to do was have us walk down the line, go to a voting machine, and press a, a lever whether you wanted to strike or not under these conditions. You were going to strike in New York alone as opposed uh, for the rest of the country straight strike. Well, the chairs were thrown asunder by the membership rushing in, and everybody was rushing, waiting to get to the machines. It was chaos was, was all over the place. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. Supposed to be a meeting where you call the meeting to order. There was nobody to call the meeting. The leadership of the branch didn't show up. They were just members. So we really started to take over. And I got to the microphone. I called the meeting to order. And we're going to vote on this. And well, what I have to tell you, the meeting, the, the vote was going to be taken by the Honest Ballot Association. And while I was up trying to get that meeting started and going on, a woman comes up to me and says, you're not the president. You can't have the microphone. Now, I can fight with men, but I'm not going to fight with a woman. So we're wrestling over the microphone. <laughs> well, she, she prevailed. <laughs> <laughs> and all that happened, that people were milling around and making noise. The media was there to say, what's going on? Uh, you still see him around, Chuck Scarborough, I think he's on WABC. He asked me, what's going on? I said, well, we're going to have a vote on whether we're going to strike or not. I guarantee you that. But I don't know how it's going to happen. Well, little uh, un unknown to me, across the street in Fahey's Gin Mill, there was a meeting of the Branch 36 leadership and the leadership of the MPO with Mo Miller because he had scheduled, they had their regular schedule executive board meeting, which they generally held at the New Yorker Hotel. And so he wanted to know what the heck is going on? Are they really going to vote for strike here or not? And the leadership of my branch, they said, Gus Johnson was then the president, said, no, they're just a few crazy, few radicals. They're not going to, they're never going to vote for a strike. Well, the rest is history. The vote took place. The vote came out 1,550 to 500, uh, to 1,000, a difference of 500 votes for strike. 
to his credit, and I'll always say this, to his credit, when the vote was uh, reported that we were on strike, Gus Johnson said Branch 36 is on strike. The shop stewards take your stations at your branches and tell the members, put up a picket line. Now, in the meantime, Jack Leventhal, who was the president of Branch 41, was at the meeting, and he jumped up to the microphone and said, brothers and sisters in Branch 36, your brothers and sisters from across the river in Brooklyn are with you 100%. We're on strike, and the place goes crazy. So that leaves Mo there with half his executive board sitting up, standing up at the, at the, at the podium, and everybody's out screaming. What about you, Mo? Are you on strike, Mo? Well, he was in an untellable position, I guess. He finally got up and says, "No, we're in a democratic union. I can't call a strike a strike on my own. I have to have a meeting and have the membership direct me as to what they want to do." Well, I don't want to tell you the kind of reception that guy. <laughs> so I was behind him. And he reports this. Mo wrote a book. And you read his book, <laughs> you'll read a, uh, in one of the chapters. He says that this fellow with dark, wavy hair gets up behind me and says, are you going to cross our picket lines? And he says, no, we're a labor union, and we belong to the FLCIO, and we won't cross a uh, bona fide picket line. I said, that's good enough for me. They're not crossing the picket lines. That means they're on strike too or whatever. <laughs> and at the end of the day, carriers walked out of GPO. Our clerks walked out from the midnight tour. Carriers walked out of all the stations that worked on the midnight tour, FDR, Grand Central, set up picket lines. It was... Uh, St. Patrick's Day, so the major parade in New York City, you know, you have those horses. People, carriers going back to the station, picked up the horses, brought them back, and set them up as, you can't cross this picket line, the <laughs> post office on strike. So now you say, why did that happen? You have people that were, that I wouldn't say mild-mannered, there were people that didn't involve themselves in these kind of things in the past. We were a labor union that you wrote a letter to your congressman and say, please vote for this bill so we get an increase in wages. You didn't do these kind of things. So how could they turn the way they did? Well, I have a theory and I'll expound it to you. In New York City, that was the times. We were living in an environment where, and I must say that it's starting to come back again right now, I sense it, where authority meant nothing, where everybody challenged authority. You had the Vietnam processes. You had the teachers went out on strike in New York against the law, the Taylor Law. You had the sanitation workers in New York went out on strike against the law, uh, and they were able to successfully negotiate better contracts for their members. The transportation workers went out on strike against the, the same law, the Tanner Law in New York, and got uh, many, many improvements for their members. You're a letter carrier, and you're in this environment. All this chaos is taking class Taking, uh, taking hold in the nation. People are fighting for what they believe are their rights, and they were their rights, and they wanted improvements. And if they weren't going to get it through peaceful means, then as somebody once said, a famous man said, they were going to get it on any, any means necessary. And one of the ways necessary was to have a strike. When that strike started, I want you to know, you had men, see, there were no women letter carriers at that time. There were probably about 30,000 now, 30,000 letter, female letter carriers. But people that had invested their life in the postal service, had worked for 
25, 30, 35 years, just waiting for their retirement. That was all on the line as far as they knew. They could lose that at the drop of a, of a, of a, a pen, of the signature of a pen. And, and while, while I'm saying this, two things happen that I must talk about. This was like, they called it a wildfire, a wildcat strike. Well, I don't know what a wildcat, it had a hell of a tail, I tell you that. <laughs> but I'll say this, that none of the national leaders, none of them, what do they want, the MPO, MPU, the NALC, the Federation of Postal Clerks, none of them stepped forward to take charge of the strike in their unions or what their members were doing. They all shied away. None of them, not a one, came to where the strike was being, was being uh, enacted to try to at least uh, talk to their membership, talk to the, the people that are out on strike, give them more encouragement. They ran away from it. I guess they were afraid the law could catch up to them. So that was one of the bad things. President Rademacher of, of, of our union, the NLC, he did a despicable thing. He not only didn't come to New York, but he went on television on Channel 2 with Senator McGee from Wyoming, and he, he stated that the strike in New York was instigated by SDS. Some of you that I may recall the SDS Students for a Democratic Society were the ones that were taking over college campuses and so on. And he was blaming it to radicals that were not so rightly connected to the Communist Party or whatever. But, and that's what he was saying, that that was a tragic mistake he made. But on the other side of the ledger, he did some good things. Those of you that worked in the post office service know, understand what I'm saying. Not one person was fired because of the strike. 200,000 people walked out. Not one po person was fired. And am I glad of that? <laughs> <laughs> and he was able to at least with the with Secretary Schultz, at the Secretary of Labor Schultz at the time, they worked out an agreement with the Congress that we did get a 14% increase in wages. But, you know, it was hard for us in New York to swallow what he did by going on television and calling us SDS, but he did his good things too. In terms of, in terms of how it changed things, I don't know, George will talk probably about that. But it's, in my view, the Postal Reorganization Act would have never passed unless, that, uh, uh, un unless that, that strike took place. And because it took place, not only did it affect letter carriers, affect all postal employees, affected all government employees, they've all, all been the best beneficiaries of that, that you heard the starting salary of a letter carrier back in 1970. I, the, start, the salary now, I believe you can reach at least $50,000 a year. Now, the Postal Service is in a lot of trouble. They're having a lot of uh, financial woes. Some can say, well, the letter carriers are making too much money, the clerks are making too much money. If that's it, that's good that they're in trouble because it promoted, well, that's meant as a, that's meant as a, a, a <laughs> it's a weak attempt of, at humor. But now what I mean by that is that we should sh have shared in what we did, our work should share what the Postal Service was able to do, and we did. And we wrote, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of letter carriers and, and federal workers have moved into the middle class because of that strike. And for labor, that is one of their 
shining moments, and, and I'm glad that I had an opportunity to participate in it, to play the role that I did. And I would just add this. Just last week, I went to my branch, and they were celebrating the 40th anniversary as we're speaking about it now. And hey, there were about 600 members at that meeting, and it was nice to see about Oh, maybe a dozen or so of the members at that meeting out of 600 hit up and say that they walked the picket lines and they were in strike. And the only sad part about it was that I thought of all of my friends and the cadre of people that we put together that started what I call the rank and file that created the opportunity for us to have a chance to express ourselves through the medium of a strike, and ultimately the success that it, prevent, it, it presented for future postal employees and other federal employees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vince, and uh, we'll have questions later on. Our next speaker is Bill Burris, He's the president of the American Postal Workers Union. The APWU represents the largest single bargaining unit in the United States, which consists of more than 280,000 clerk, maintenance, and motor vehicle employees working in 37,000 facilities in the United States Postal Service. In 2001, Bill was elected to the executive council of the AFL-CIO where he serves as a vice president. Over his, his long career, Bill has held numerous positions within the APWU and other representative organizations. He, uh, he began his, his employment with the Postal Service in 1958 as a distribution clerk in Cleveland and was a, a participant in the postal strike of 1970. Each year since, since 2002, each year, Ebony Magazine has named Bill one of the 100 plus most influential black Americans. Bill. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for convening this forum and uh, thank you for uh, putting me behind Vince. <laughs> Can you imagine that, you know, 35, 40 minutes with uh, in-depth history of what happened, by whom, without notes, you know? <laughs> what can I say? But um, it's my turn. Let me speak on behalf, from my perspective, of what happened and why. Um, and I would like to take you back uh, to that time and give you a view from my perspective, from my perspective as a participant and employee of the Cleveland, Ohio, local and as an officer of the NPU union in Cleveland. And explain as best I can, as Vince tried to do, how and why did 200,000 posted employees defy their government and shut down the largest postal system in the world? And as one participant, uh, what was I thinking as the events unfolded? Um, we like to romanticize the past. Uh, I guess that's a human nature. The grass was always greener, the sky was always bluer. In fact, yesterday was a day just like tomorrow. But March 17th was just a normal day that promised to be like any other day. In Cleveland, Ohio, where I was employed, the weather was moderate with a clear sky. It was just a normal day. Uh, it was a Tuesday. Uh, nothing spectacular, nothing remarkable about it. We were not prepared for anything. We attended uh, our various duties as posted employees, went about our work just normally. And most of us, as Vince explained, the pay was so inadequate, most of us had two jobs. So we were either coming from a second job or completing our postal work to begin the second job. Uh, 
on that Tuesday, I was in my 16th year of service and was attempting to decide for myself and my family whether or not it would be a career. I was at just about the tipping point that if I were to work another two or three years, I'd be too far gone to turn away and go to work somewhere else. So at the time of the action in New York and subsequently around the country, uh, I was deciding my future employment. The pay, as explained earlier, was $3 an hour, about $240 a pay if you worked full 80 hours, and not all employees did. And after deductions, it was barely enough to live off of. If one had a family, uh, responsibilities, automobiles were out of the question, we caught buses to work. But uh, it was a tough time. Uh, the work was constant, the pay was anemic, and supervision was oppressive. It was a military, quasi-military uh, place of work. And I continued this employment, it was on the roll, and actively employed on April the 17th, the day prior to the beginning of the chaos, the, the breakout, the strike, if you will. The background is the Congress had repeatedly promised to correct the pay situation for posted employees. And it was almost routine. It became a part of the daily lexicon that there was a bill pending that would address our situation time after time. And periodically, every three or four years, a matter of fact, less than two years prior to the strike, there had been a pay, pay, a pay increase initiated for posted employees. Inadequate though it was, uh, there was a pay increase. And once again, there was legislation pending to increase our pay. And the multiple union organizations, you have to appreciate there were nine union employee organizations at the time. Uh, I'll give you their titles in a moment, but uh, there was not just a letter carriers and a clerks, there were a total of nine different organizations. And there was no central message. If you're gonna call a strike for a national bargaining unit in every city of the country, every geographical area, uh, then you would think that the organization would develop a unified message. There would be something going out to all the employees that was similar in its scope. Uh, that was not the case in the post service in uh, that date in 1970. Uh, to re they, they were not attempting at that time to reflect the, the membership's focus, the employee focus, to the issues of the day. So there was no recipe, there was nothing that was uh, leading to the possibility of a nationwide walkout. So unlike most issues causing labor unrest, there was no coordination of a response and there was no central planning, absolutely no central planning. So to fully appreciate the tone of the day, one must look beyond what was occurring in the posters among their leaders. And as Vince said, the country was gauged in a divisive war Youth were rebelling against the rules of the prior generation. Civil rights were in major contention. Uh, we had serious civil rights issues still up until 1970. The nation was still coming to grips with the rights of ordinary, ordinary people to engage in collective action. The strikes of steel and auto and coal had not been forgotten by that generation of Americans. That was still vivid in our imagination and our memory. And the right to work legislation was a general topic of discussion throughout the country. So there were postal labor issues in New York as well that transcended the congressional action on postal pay. One looking back, and most of the scholars would say that what triggered it was the uh, con congressional action to give themselves a 41% pay raise while giving postal employees only a 4% pay raise. But we had suffered that, that, that defeat before. We understood the, the nuances of the legislative process and democracy uh, at its worst, and we had become almost uh, inoculated against the disappointment. So that in and of itself did not and would not have generated a nationwide strike. Uh, this was the backdrop in 1970, uh, these factors that were permeating our entire country and uh, that predated the nationwide strike of uh, government employees closing down a government service. For 195 years, the Postal Service had existed to bind the nation together, and there had been no major labor disruption in that, all that time. So after repeated promises, Congress uh, uh, failed in delivering the increase in pay, and 
uh, wages became the rallying cry across the country, even though that was not the factor. And if one were to research the communiques from the respective labor organizations in the month prior to the great strike of 1970, one will not find a mention of a walkout. Uh, I went back in our archives and looked at APW, UFPC publications to try to find out because I was not in Washington on April of 1970. I was in Cleveland, Ohio as an employee. So I was trying to recall exactly what were they preparing the troops for. Was there a trigger point that once it was released that it would generate some further action? And there was no prior winning, warning that was given. But one a subtext of the anger stoked among the New York City letter carriers was the dismissal, as Vince explained, of the striking letter carriers from the previous incident. That was a factor there. We in Cleveland had no knowledge of the prior incident. If we did, knew anything about it, it was very limited. So uh, in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, those of us in other parts of the country had very little focus on what had occurred in New York prior to uh, the action. Uh, so it is a disservice to the strikers to point to a single issue, any single issue, that influenced 200,000 posted employees who followed the lead of the letter carriers in New York. And, you know, anyone, any true scholar of the strike in 1970 have to return to Vince Lombrado as the catalyst for all the action that followed. It started there. It was spread around the country through the media, through word of mouth, through union channels. And the rest of us in other parts of the country eventually followed suit. Some of us, not all of us. Uh, it was St. Patrick's Day. Uh, that day prior to the strike was a holiday, if you will. And uh, they had scheduled a meeting that I was un unaware of. Uh, I didn't know that there were a meeting in New York on, uh, on uh, March 17th that they were going to consider anything. We weren't meeting in Cleveland. But they met, and the word spread across the country. And as we later learned, over the wishes of their president of New York, Gus Johnson, uh, the vote was taken, a very close vote. And those who were minicized today, uh, they uh, presented as though it was a major uprising. What have happened? 555 had voted not to strike, and 1005 had voted to strike. What had been the outcome of that? Would there have been another incident that would have triggered it as well at a later time? Would there have been another leader like Vince? Or would Vince himself stepped up with another issue at a later time because the, the issues of the previously fired letter carriers in New York had still been unresolved? But the fact is, what happened was, by a 500-vote mar margin, those letter carriers did, in fact, vote to strike, struck. And those of us in other parts of the country uh, heard and read of the actions, and we began to take the actions on our own. Uh, following the carry vote, they set up pickets in New York, and the clerks, who were the first to report to work on the following day, uh, that was in the evening on the 17th, on the 18th, the clerks of the states and the branches were first to report. So when they came to work, the picket signs were up, and as they said, Mo had indicated that we don't cross picket lines. So they refused to go in. And at that point, the strike was on. Uh, it was on in New York. They shut down the entire metropolitan area, the mail system. And uh, in the days to follow, in other parts of the country, particularly in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was employed, employed uh, we took strike votes. And uh, we walked out as well. Uh, Mo, who was my predecessor as president of APW, my mentor, and I will honor him forever, he refused to take strike votes. Uh, Vince shared with you uh, Mo's presence at the meeting with Gus Johnson and Mo's commitment. But as he returned to the NPU uh, membership, uh, there were individuals that were inciting that there should be a strike, and they wanted to get a strike immediately. And Mo said, no, I'm not going to take a vote, and they chased him out of the room. They, they, they really chased Mo out of the meeting room, uh, and he said, I'm, I'm going to have a referendum. Not referendum, but I'm going to have a ballot a vote. And the following day, they took a vote, and it was overwhelming to strike. So at that point, officially, uh, they were on strike, and the rest of us, we took votes in our respective cities. In Cleveland, Ohio, I was a member of the National Postal Union. Uh, we did not have exclusive rep representation, and it was a very relatively small membership. About 200 postal employees in Cleveland belonged to the NPU. 
the dominant union had about 2,000 members, so we were uh, small fish in a big pond. And, but they were magnanimous enough to hold a meeting on the night of the 18th of all the unions, maintenance motor vehicles, special delivery, uh, letter care, well, letter carriers were already on strike, but all of us who were not on strike, they held a meeting to get the wishes of the employees, not the membership, but the employees, what they were going to do. Uh, I was a young man, an instigator, loudmouth, and had a lot to say at that meeting, and we took the vote, and it was overwhelming to strike. So on the 19th, Cleveland joined others around the country, Pittsburgh and others, Chicago, that had taken employee votes, membership votes, the, to agree to go out on strike as well. Um, it was a festive event. Um, we had not prepared enough to have signs. There was no organization because it was not led by the union leadership. It was individuals starting standing outside the building, walking around, making noise, jeering those who went in. Uh, we'd honk at traffic and wave at people. We did all of the, uh, all of the motions of legitimate strikers, but we were just posted employees on the street expressing our demand that we wanted better pay, better benefits, and a fair shake. But um, we, uh, we did not have any formal structure. We, we did not engage in any unified activity. And the clerk's union, that was by far the largest in the community, uh, did not coordinate any of our efforts. And let me make one point. The other union, this was primarily, the strike of 1970, was primarily a strike of letter carriers and clerks. Uh, there were nine unions. Those unions were the maintenance union, motor vehicle, the Special Delivery Union, the Mail Handlers Union, the Rural Carriers Union, the City Letter Carriers Union, and the National Alliance of Postal Employees, who had a strong foothold in most of the major metropolitan areas around the country, Cleveland, Chicago, Atlanta, that was their base. They had a sizable membership. They were fighting the, the civil rights battle, and there were few African-American supervisors at the time. They had some legitimate issues, so they had a presence. They were eerily silent throughout the period of strike. At no point did they come forward with any information to their members or uh, advice as to what they should do in terms of responding to the demand of a majority of the other uh, represented employees. Uh, the strike began almost immediately to have devastating effect on our country, on the economy of our country. Wall Street was threatened to shut down. Uh, there were rumors that they were, they never did, but there was threat and they would have to close down Wall Street. But we had chicks and we had uh, frogs and perishables in the posters sitting there for two, three, four, five days, unprocessed, undelivered, just sitting there. Uh, mortgage payments, car payments, electric payments, it was all embargoed in the posters and couldn't move. You know, it was not only the letter carriers weren't delivering any mail, there was no mail being processed. So the mail was backing up. They were shutting collection boxes permanently so people could not deposit any more mail. It was the entire system was embargoed. And uh, there was, at some point, it became a sense of panic on the part of the government officials. What were they going to do? They had already tried threatening. They had gathered the leaders together and gave them ultimatums that you either get the employees back to work by such and such a date or we begin to initiate fines and uh, threaten incarceration and other actions against them personally. But none of that was moving the employees. The employees, uh, because of a variety of factors, and I would be hesitant to put my finger on any single issue uh, beyond the New York situation, but that in itself does not explain what happened in Cleveland or uh, Peoria, Illinois. Uh, that did not caused those individual employees. And just money, that alone by itself, did not cause those employees to strike. But the presidents got together, and they uh, issued a statement. And uh, collectively, all the union presidents, uh, the craft presidents, all got together and drafted a statement to issue to the uh, employees to coerce them to come back to work. And that statement was, uh, I think it's important to read it, because I think the words uh, reflect exactly where we were at the time, how the, the gap that existed between those that are governed and those responsible for governing between the leaders and the employees. The statement said, because of the provisions of the executive order, 
11491, the labor agreement existing between the organizations and the post office department and the existing statutes, we cannot support or condone the service interruption which has occurred and we collectively instruct all affected posted employees to return to work immediately. This was the joint statement signed by all of the presidents, all of the union presidents to the workers uh, to return to work immediately. Uh, the result was the workers were in front of their leaders. Uh, the workers uh, reacting to the, uh, the actions by Vince and the officers, the, the employees in New York, the workers that decided to do something contrary uh, to their leaders. Uh, and as I said, the, the history record the events accurately. This was a strike of city letter carriers and clerks. Now, not because I represent clerks, but the fact is the motor vehicle maintenance, special delivery messengers, the rural letter carriers, uh, they were nowhere to be found as, uh, as symbols of their respective organizations. I'm sure uh, in some areas, particularly in New York, because Mo had 27,000 members and they represented all the crafts in New York, all the inside crafts and maintenance motor vehicle. So I'm sure some of those individuals uh, engaged in withholding of their label, uh, labor as well as engaging in picketing. But as an organization, not just from their leaders, but they did not rally their membership through any form, at meetings, through uh, telephone networks, any other means of rallying their members uh, to engage in this activity. So uh, this action that occurred affecting ultimately about 200, 220,000 postal employees was led and generally controlled totally by city letter carriers and clerks. Uh, the APW merger, where we brought five unions into one, did not occur until uh, uh, months later, 15 months later. Uh, now they threatened us, uh, the government threatened us, the postmaster general threatened us, and at the local level, the supervisors and postmasters, individual postmasters, were threatening officers. I mean, th threat threatening employees that uh, we're taking your picture, we know who you are, you have to return to work. But we were, we were determined, and as I said, it was almost like a carnival-like atmosphere. We were serious. We knew we could be fired, but uh, we were not going to return until uh, our desires, our needs were satisfied, and the only thing that could satisfy that would be uh, adequate pay increases that we could support uh, our families. Agreements were reached uh, on March 25th after a seven-day strike, and... Uh, Seven days from the beginning to the end is not a protect, protracted strike. You know, we have experienced ones that have gone years in the making. But because our enterprise is so central to the American economy, uh, the, we had shut down the entire American communication system. Uh, telephones, telegraph, they still work, they were effective, but for all written communications, including financial tra transactions that were transacted through the mail, they had been shut down. Uh, and we had achieved our goal. We got their attention uh, on the 25th. Agreement was reached after some, some feints because initially uh, President Rademacher had reached an agreement, a separate agreement, representing just letter cares, not the other unions. He did it on his own and reached an agreement. But when it was revealed it was soundly rejected, requiring the parties to go back to the table again to get a subsequent agreement. And that subsequent agreement on March 25th was still just a promise. Uh, because of the law, uh, the negotiators, either when George Meading was involved, Schultz, Schultz was involved, uh, but because of the law, they did not have the authority to adjust postal pay. That could only come about through legislation. So what they were doing is reaching an agreement on things they would promise us. And we were comfortable enough on the 25th that their promises would be fulfilled and that subsequently there would be, in fact, legislation passed to give us the deserved pay raises. And uh, we, uh, the achievements of the strike were out, out astonishing. And one, I know Vince never imagined when they were taking that strike vote in New York that it would lead to what finally was achieved. And uh, they were a 14% pay increase in combination. That's what we got out of the strike. Reduction in time from entry, 
to top step from 21 years to eight years, that had been a major obstacle of ours. Uh, exclusive jurisdiction, because we were under executive orders up to that point where the unions didn't really have the right of collective bargaining. Uh, we got exclusive jurisdiction, collective bargaining rights, and perhaps most importantly, amnesty that not a single employee, unlike the air traffic controller strike that was to follow in 1981, and all of the employees were, were, were fired, not a single employee suffered uh, disciplinary action as a result of withholding their labor. And never before since have any government workers engaged in an activity that ended as successfully with so much at stake. And uh, I'm, I'm proud, certainly, when I look back at my involvement, uh, I'm proud that uh, I was a participant, but it's only a question of age. Uh, those that weren't born early enough could not have participated. Uh, many that uh, were not old enough at the time, were still in high school or grade school, uh, had not entered the post service, certainly could not have participated in the strike. So my generation uh, was there. Uh, we met the call, and uh, we uh, held the only the first and the only nationwide strike of a government agency in our country, and we did it successfully. And uh, we that did participate uh, uh, and now have responsibilities for uh, enacting and carrying forth the positives that came out of that strike, uh, we are, will forever be uh, thankful to the leaders like Dents who began, started the ball rolling. They certainly can't take all of the credit for everything that happened, but they started it. And we did it, we won, and I think every posted employee uh, is a beneficiary of their action. Thank you, Vince. I uh, sympathize and empathize with you, Bill. Uh, in a former life, I was uh, vice president of delivery for the Postal Service, and I also found myself for years following Vince. And, <laughs> and it was very, very difficult, but you did a, you did a great job. Thank you. Our, our next speaker, I think, is going to be coming from a, a little different perspective. George Gould has 30 years of legislative consulting experience. He's a veteran of Capitol Hill. George was staff director of the House Subcommittee on Postal Operations and Services from 1976 to 79. Prior to that, he directed the Subcommittee on Postal Personnel and Modernization for four years and the Subcommittee on Postal Facilities, Mail, and Labor Management for two years. Also, the Subcommittee, there's a lot of subcommittees, right? Also, the Subcommittee on Census and Population for two years, and he was administrative assistant to Congressman Charlie Wilson for four years. Recently, George retired from the National Association of Letter Carriers, where he served as legislative and political director for 28 years. All yours. Thank you very much. Um, after the uh, excellent presentation of the two presidents, I have a suggestion. Uh, there was a reference to um, evaluation forms. If you would give all those to my wife, Diane, I promise you she'll fill them out objectively about how the three people do on this panel. I, I obviously want to uh, say, in fact and in truth, the honor to be here today with two leaders of the labor movement uh, that have been recognized, as was referenced, uh, not only by the, uh, the facts of, of history, but by the people that have had the opportunity to work with them. I also want to thank Alan for his work at the museum. I think anyone who's paid attention or has been involved in the development and the growth of this museum knows that it would not have happened without Alan's leadership and contribution. Thank you, Alan. I also sincerely want to thank Vince Sombrato for giving me the opportunity that he gave me to lobby uh, for working people who did and have and still do an outstanding job on behalf of the country. And I worked closely with 
the postal clerks and mail handlers and later the American Postal Workers Union over the years. Uh, so that had been, has been a great pleasure. I also want to mention that when I was putting my presentation together, I wanted to make sure that the facts were correct. And so I, um, I contacted an old friend of mine, Richard Barton, who also served on the staff of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee to check and make sure that my references were accurate. So I want to alert you. You have two old men determining if we remembered what happened. <laughs> Uh, with that qualification, uh, I also want to go back and say that Vince not only was a great leader of his union, which is obvious, but he also had the ability, the instinct, to understand and deal with Congress in an effective way. He came to Washington and I'm sure he would say did not really understand the process, hadn't been directly exposed to it and wondered about it like everybody else who was exposed to it. But realized he wasn't going to change the process. He wasn't going to change Washington. And we've had some postmasters general, and I'm not being critical, but it's accurate, who came to Washington, didn't like what things were being done, and they decided that they were going to leave because they didn't get what they wanted. Vince decided he was going to learn how the process worked and utilize that knowledge to effectively represent and lead the letter carriers. And in that environment, he allowed me to do the job that I did, and others will determine whether I did a good job, but he gave me the opportunity to advocate for the union in an environment in which I was allowed to make friends and influence people on behalf of the letter carriers and in conjunction with his leadership. And the reality is that there's a negative attitude about lobbyists, but let me say that the lobbyists, remember this, the lobbyists protect you from the people you elect. <laughs> so you want to have someone advocating for you, and you want to advocate for yourself. And then finally, let me say as a, as a short introduction, what I'm going to give you today is the congressional perspective. There might be some feelings in the audience that there might be some inconsistencies or some contradiction with what Vince and Bill said. There isn't. This is congressional perspective. In some cases, they're correct. In some cases, their perspective of what was going on was, frankly, ter terribly inaccurate. Uh, so keep that in mind as I go through this. Keep this in mind, too, that in the 60s, the Congress had changed uh, in, in considerably uh, from a time when the Speaker of the House was totally in charge to a format in which the chairs of the committee were in charge of their committees. And they had ultimate authority and a great deal of power. However, it also was an environment where things were generally done in a bipartisan manner. I know you've heard this before, but it was, it was reality. Uh, yes, members took positions on party politics and ideology and substance, but they also worked together on a bipartisan basis. And you'll see as I present this that this was a reality in relationship to postal reform. You didn't have Republicans over here having an attitude that was necessarily different from the Democrats as you have right now, for instance, on the health care issue that we're dealing with on the Hill as we talk. And that made a major difference in, frankly, accommodating the needs of the workers that, uh, that ultimately happened. Um, and also, the Postmaster General in those days, and there were some negative uh, aspects of this, but he was a, a political creature. He was a politician. Uh, and since the Postal Service was, a, in a great extent, a political entity, this also helped. Uh, in, my, in that mind, Larry O'Brien was the Postmaster General when they first started considering postal reform. Larry O'Brien had been Lyndon Johnson's campaign manager. And after he left office, that is the Postmaster General job, he became the national chair of the Democratic Party. And some of you will remember that he was the chair of the party when Richard Nixon and company sent people into the Watergate Hotel to try to, to record and find paperwork that the Democratic Party has been exercising during the period in the 70s. So this was the kind of environment we're talking about. Some of it was negative, as I just explained, but some of it was very positive. Also, the groups were very active. The unions, 
and the management groups, that is the supervisors and the postmasters. They were politically active and, and that was important. In fact, literally the first lobbyist that I met after I took my first job as chief of staff to the congressman was Patton Island who represented the postal clerks. He literally was the first person to come in and introduce himself. The second person was a lobby lobbyist whose name was Dave Bunn and he represented the parcel post shippers. So there was a great deal of active uh, successful lobbying in Washington. And in reality, um, Rademacher himself, Jimmy Rademacher, the president of the letter carriers, did a lot of his own lobbying and was constantly, frankly, taking me to lunch and my boss to dinner, taking us to a railroad, to, uh, to outings, which, uh, and, and trying to influence our decisions. And, and this was the way the environment was. And at, at, in this environment, the postal pay issue, as Bill pointed out, was decided in, in, a, in a general environment in which, frankly, members weren't paying attention as to what the level of pay was. They looked at this as a safe job under civil service protection. And, and the pay, while important, wasn't as important as it really was to the individuals. And there was lots of members and certainly staff that knew that, that letter carriers and clerks often had two jobs. But the attitude was that they had a secure job, a job that gave them a secure future, and if they had to have another job at the same time, that's the way it goes, because the politicians didn't want to be on record voting for pay raises for federal employees. Because then the people and the, and the other politicians in the press would make a big deal out of it. So there was a lot of political pressure not to do the fair thing. And it appeared to them that these people had other jobs, but they seemed to be coping with it, so it was not a problem. The other issue was they made these raises, they coupled these raises with raises for other federal employees. So some of those federal employees were doing well, and it was a package deal. So you put together a package and it gave everybody a 4% pay raise. Some of them were happy and they told their members that. Some weren't and some were talking about it as loud as they should. So that was the environment. And let me then move to a major issue that was being considered at the time because this had a major influence on it. And that was postal reform. There's two major happenings, if you will, that affected the success of postal reform legislation. One was obviously thoroughly and accurately discussed by my two predecessors, and I'll touch base on that to a certain extent as how it influenced Congress. And the other was also um, mentioned by Alan, and that was, that was the backup of the mail in Chicago uh, in 1966, which was a major happening. What had happened is the Postal Service for its whole generation had been a political environment, as I just explained. And so a lot of things had not been implemented. For instance, uh, the mechanization was not keeping up with the, with the volume increase. The employees were not being paid at the level they should have been paid. The postmasters were politically appointed. The rural letter carriers were politically appointed. And so all of this kind of contributed to a system that had kind of frozen in time. And so in Chicago, in 1966, the mail backed up and stopped the facility, the regional facility, from working. And as Alan said, literally 10 million pieces of mail got jammed throughout the facility. And that really had an awakening, if you will, for some of the people that were involved in the postal world. In addition, as I said, and I want to stress this, the postmasters and the letter, rural letter carriers were politically appointed, and I'm not at all criticizing the individual <laughs> postmaster or rural letter carriers, but there were instances when they were, re when they were appointed under these circumstances without regard to their interest or their ability in the jobs. Uh, and, and that was just a reality. Postal facilities were placed where politicians wanted them placed not necessarily strategically 
where they should have been placed from a processing and a delivery standard. And Congress heavily influenced by the large mailers often made decisions concerning postal rates that were, did not reflect the needs of the system. And the two major events that happened, the Chicago 1966 backup, and as Vince and Bill said, the postal strike in 1970 really woke people up. And while the employee organizations were concerned with the pay structure and obviously wanted to adjust it, the mailers, on the other hand, were kind of happy the way things were going. And the political parties were happy because they had patronage. And so postal reform and the postal strike not only was the right thing from an, the employee's point of view, it, it put light on the picture. As referenced earlier about these two issues, I also want to make the point that there was a congressman from Chicago that was in Congress when the backup happened in Chicago. And his name was Ed Dwinsky. And he was a member of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee, and for a long time. And Vince and I worked with him and, and, and the APWU and other unions for a long time. But he was on the committee, a junior member, but on the committee. And he was very upset, obviously, with the backup uh, and, and the problem that it caused his city and his area. And after three weeks, as it was referenced, uh, it finally started to come together. And he made the comment, and I'm going to read some quotes because I took a lot of notes in my career, and I promise I'm not going to write any books. It's, it's all right. And I said, he said in his, when he was referenced this, politics make strange postmasters. <laughs> and what he meant was a lot of the people that were in charge of the postal process and system were people that had been politically appointed and not necessarily were directly interested in promoting what was best for the system. But the good news was that the Postmaster General, Larry O'Brien, why he was political, he said that this was a sign of a major problem. So in, in, 19, in April 3rd, 1967, he gave a speech to the Magazine Publishers Association of America, and I was there for the speech and listened to it, and at that speech, he talked about the problems with the system. And he said, and he said that he was going to recommend a creation of a government-owned corporation that had its own board of directors. And they'd be appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And there would be an independent rate-making process. And that the political patronage would be eliminated. After the presentation, he went to President Johnson and he recommended that Johnson form a commission to make recommendations about changing the system. Within days, I mean a few days, Johnson appointed a commission. And very smartly, most of the people on the commission were Republicans, but they were business people who could readily see that the system was broken. He also put George Meany, president of AFL-CIO, on the board. And he also had Murray Calmero as the executive director, who some of us have known for a long time. And with seven out of nine of the members of the commission Republicans, it made it very difficult for the business community to start saying that this was a fix for the unions. But by putting Meany on there, and O'Brien being the postmaster general, and Johnson being himself, he thought that, that there would be a, an honest observation and overview of the system. The commission came out with its report in 1968, uh, and it also recommended uh, to a great degree what had been discussed. A board of governors who would be appointed by the president with consent of the Senate, independently financed system, uh, and no political patronage. The report came at the end of the Johnson administration, so he couldn't implement it. And the new president, Richard Nixon, however, was strongly in support of the concept. And he appointed Winton Blunt to be the Postmaster General, who stipulated that he wouldn't take the job unless the administration was seriously committed to postal reform as a businessman. He was anti-union in his philosophy and very pro-business, 
but he recognized that the system was broken. It wasn't helping anybody, employees, customers, anyone. However, the Post Office and Civil Service Committee members were not happy with, po with the suggestion of postal reorganization. The chairman of the committee was Thaddeus Dulski of Buffalo, and there's a lot of stories there, and I'll be glad to tell them when we have more time or in the break or whenever, because they're fun. And the ranking Republican was Robert Corbett of Pennsylvania, who also was quite an interesting person. And they thought that these recommendations would undermine congressional authority. They didn't like them at all. They didn't want to give up their patronage. And the Republicans thought, hey, we got a Republican president. It's our turn now to get all these jobs. Why should we change things now? The administration had to reach down to a lower level on the committee, that is, members with less seniority, to get anybody to even sponsor a bill that reflected the commission's recommendation. And they contacted Mo Udall of Arizona, who, as you know, was a presidential candidate later in his career, and whose son and nephew are now in the United States Senate, and Ed Dworsky, who I referenced earlier. O'Brien then, with the help of uh, a Senator Morton, who was chairman of the Republican Party, put together a citizens' lobbying group called the Citizens Committee for Postal Reform. And they put together a very sophisticated media campaign and had very smart lobbying, grassroots media, people who knew people, and also Blunt gave briefings to the House Post Office and Civil Service Committee in secret about why this should happen. With all this, the postal unions and the management groups particularly the United Federation of Postal Clerks, and at that point, as Vince pointed out, the National Association of Letter Carriers on the, on the national level opposed reform. They thought the political process benefited them. They liked the civil service system. They thought it protected them. They thought their relationships with congressmen actually gave them an advantage. So why would they want to change that system? Now, they wanted the pay raise, but they didn't want the system changed. So what they wanted was separate legislation that gave them a pay raise, but they kept the present law as it was. So that's where they were coming from. And the reality was that it was going to be very hard to get the kind of pay raise they needed because the administration decided that the only way they were going to get reform was to join it with a pay raise so that they would get the employees motivated to support it and they would get their reform. So there was obviously a conflict at that point. Because of the problems in Chicago and the political pressure that the administration brought to the committee, Dulski, the chairman, decided, and he was very angry about this, and I was in meetings with him, that he had to put something together. He had to do something. So he put together what was called H.R. 4. For those of you who don't pay attention, it's the House Resolution 4. It's a bill that's introduced and by a congressman, and it contained some reforms. He overhauled the structure to a certain extent, uh, a little bit on the financing. It had uh, uh, the postal rate making was changed, but he kept the executive department, postmaster was appointed by the president, and he kept political patronage because the members liked it. Udall and Dewinsky then introduced the administration's bill, or the bill that was recommended by the commission, and that was 11750, and that was the postal reform bill that they were pushing. Then what happened was the Postal Department uh, and the administration on October 8, 1969, pushed to have a vote on their bill. This is October 1969, as you heard, the strike was the following March. Letter carriers, postal clerks, my friend Patton Island, Jimmy Rademacher, actually took me to a racetrack to talk to me about this. I'll never forget it. Um, effectively and uh, lobbied against, yeah, um, and I never did find out, Bill, whether you won or lost either. So. I, actually, I won. See, In those days, the lobbyists made sure you won. Yeah. Uh, effect, I can't tell any more than that, Bill. We'd all get in trouble. 
uh, lobbied against the administration reform legislation. They, they were opposed to it. That is the, the unions in the, in the group. And a very good friend of the union movement who also thought reform was a good idea, is a good example of what was going on. His name was Jerry Waldy. He was a congressman from, from California. And he later actually, uh, after he left the House, he actually was a, gave advice to the letter carriers in the capacity as a, and he, he was a very bright and very good guy. He, he only left the House because he ran for the Senate and didn't make it. In fact, he was beat by Jerry Brown in the, in the primary. In any case, Jerry Waldy said after he listened to all the debate about postal reform, and I want to quote him, some of my friends are for postal reform and some of my friends are against it. I'm with my friends. <laughs> when the bill failed in the committee on a tie vote, even though with all this pressure, uh, Udall and Lewinsky and the administration were able to get a tie vote, Congressman Udall said, everything that should be said has been said, but I haven't said it yet. <laughs> I, I'm not giving up at this point. In Washington, other issues affecting the post community was, other major issue affecting the post community was exactly what Vince and Bill talked about. It was low pay for postal workers. They've given you the data and the levels, and so I won't go there. All I say is that it was recognized it was a problem, but again, what had happened was they gave everybody a small raise, as Bill said, a year before. Then they were looking at another small raise, 4.7, for all federal postal employees that would not be retroactive, would only be prospective. And they thought that was going to solve the problem. And then they decided that if they were going to do any more than that, it had to be linked to postal reform. Otherwise, the administration wasn't going to give postal reform. And the Nixon administration then held up the pay raise that had been put into effect. So kind of talk about salt in the wounds. So with the employees grossly underpaid, and members of Congress were aware of this, uh, and in November 1969, the Nixon administration used this issue, as I said, to start opening discussions with Jimmy Rademacher, the president of the letter carriers. The idea being is that we can put together reform and get you a pay raise, and we can work together, we can get this done. And I should point out a couple of interesting political things. Nixon, with all of his challenges, was a brilliant politician. One of the things he did during that time, Jimmy's wife was ill and was in the hospital in, in Alexandria. And I know this because we had, the mutual, we had mutual doctor. Diane had, my wife Diane had, uh, had found this doctor and we were both going to the same doctor. So this is how I found out about it. President Nixon actually called the hospital called Jimmy Rademacher to find out how his wife was doing in the hospital, to, to continue the relationship and to improve the personal aspects of the relationship. Also, the point person on this issue was Chuck Colson. Now, some of you remember Chuck Colson. Uh, and I've got a, a, a quote about one of the people that worked with him, not, not a negative from a, uh, an outsider, but they called him the evil genius, one of them called him, the evil genius, and the other called him ruthless in getting things done. And he was the one on a staff level, White House staff level. And one of the things he recommended, Vince, and I don't know if you know that, but he recommended that at the, uh, when the, I'm jumping a little bit to make this point, but he recommended when the strike was, was, was going on that uh, the administration looked into hiring thugs to beat up some of the strikers in hopes they would break the strike. This is the kind of guy he was. So he had been assigned to be the White House person to, you know, to deal with this religious. issue. Hmm? I said he's religious now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now a religious convert. That's right. Yes. So, so, so now God will punish you if you disagree with him. I said it. So at that point, they sat down with Rademacher, uh, and that was Schultz, as Vince mentioned, the secretary, and also Mr. Blunt, and the president himself was often. There's pictures of him actually being involved. 
and they were um, they wanted to make sure that they put this package together. Rademacher was still a, um, opposed to postal reorganization as it was being uh, presented to him, but he saw the opportunity to use it to get a pay raise. So what happened was that um, they suggested, and Rademacher raised the issue, that they could include collective bargaining in the package. Some form, it wasn't defined, some form of collective bargaining. And because of that, uh, they proceeded to uh, talk. And I'm going to jump a little bit on this because at that point, uh, they tried to reach an agreement with the unions, but it failed. So Dulski moved the chairman of the committee to bring up his own postal reorganization at H.R. Ford before the committee. And on March 12th, at a closed meeting, they marked up the bills. And there was a number of lobbying going on concerning the bill. One of them was Bob Nix, who, a congressman from Pennsylvania, who on behalf of Nyland wanted to make sure the postal clerk could still case mail on trains because he had both trains out of Philadelphia and postal employees. So there was a lot of internal things going on. Our, our Congressman Olson um, from Montana was involved. He chaired the subcommittee on postal rates. He uh, wanted to make sure he kept that power. So there was a lot of debate going on, and the reality was that inside, on a secret vote, they were able to substitute, substitute the administration's bill, the Udall Dewinsky bill, for Dulski's bill by one vote. And they kept that secret, and the public vote then was to adopt that vote 17 to 6. And that was the beginning of the postal reform initiative. And even though the reform bill at that point contained a pay raise, it was not enough. And so it was still in trouble, and the postal unions and management groups were still opposing it. But finally, they adjusted the pay raise, and they thought they'd have it done, and then on March 17th and the 18th, the strike hit. Initially, members of Congress were very upset and angry. They're breaking the law, it's illegal, they shouldn't be doing this, it's a bad precedent. So for a short period of time, it actually had a neg negative effect. Blunt used it, Nixon used it, trying to move their bill and saying, see, these people are out of control, we, sh we shouldn't play into the strike. That went on for a while, and then concerns started to develop that the strike actually was, being, was effective. As you know, the president made a, a national uh, speech about, uh, about this, and then he sent in the National Guard. They didn't know how to case the mail. And the letter case, hmm? It's hard to do without labels. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's hard to do if you've never been in a postal facility. And the letter carriers played it very smart. They didn't, they didn't get angry. They didn't show <laughs> resistance. They actually stood there and waved at the, uh, at the guys when they came in, the soldiers the National Guard and let them, you know, go ahead, and they just blew it. They didn't know how to do it. So after a while, it was clear to the Nixon administration that wasn't going to work. So then the negotiations picked up again, and as Vince said, the strike kept on going, and so then deals were cut. And I've, got to, I've got to move quickly here, but deals were cut on the amnesty issue and on the pay issue. And the, and the compromise was a 6% increase in the postal reform bill and then a separate bill for 8% totaling 14%, so both sides had their way, and the postal employees got the raise they had, and the postal reform bill had collective bargaining. So collective bargaining, two pay raises. At that point, the other unions that had resisted supporting it decided that it was something they could support, so they got behind the bill. And when that happened, then the bill moved rather rapidly, and it, it passed the House overwhelmingly, this, the committee overwhelmingly had passed the House by over 300 votes, 307, and then in a little while it passed the Senate, and at that point it was signed into law um, uh, by the President. Uh, the bottom line is that without the unions and their strike, uh, without their involvement and their tenacity and their relationships with members of Congress, uh, this wouldn't have happened. 
And ironically, during this period, presidents of other were because they thought it would negatively affect them. And they were married to the civil service system, and they thought this would be a bad omen for them. So here was the leadership of the unions progressing to the point that they not only got the pay increase, they got collective bargaining, and they got a restructuring. And it turned out to be a much better system than the system that some of the leaders of the unions and members of Congress thought that they would miss when they lost it. And the collective bargaining, and I don't have to tell you all, has worked and worked very effectively and worked a heck of a lot better than the civil service system. So when President John, uh, Nixon signed it on August 1970, August 12th, that was the beginning of a new world for the postal system. And while the system has problems again, the problems aren't with the employees, and the problems aren't with collective bargaining, and the problems aren't with the pay level of employees. The problems are, are with changing times. So we're going to be looking at this again in that context. And hopefully, we will, we will do what is necessary to make those changes so the system continues. Thank you. about in terms of the Post Reorganization Act and specifically the question of collective bargaining. When that came, as, as you know, right back and double crossed all the other postal uh, presidents, because they were all against it and we were for it. It came to me in New York, Gus Johnson said, well, look, at this is gonna be good. We're gonna have collective bargaining. The question I asked him, what happens if there's an impasse? Will we have binding arbitration? Will we have a third party make the decision, and will that decision be binding? He said, I'll bring it back to Radovaca, and that's finally in the bill, and as Boris and I can both uh, address the situation, that has been a godsend for us. Thank you. Uh, we have some time now for some questions. And who would like to ask a question or a distinguished panel? Okay. Yes. Excuse me. Sir. I, I go, uh, you I'm wanna, sorry. You want to use this? I want to use the microphone. Okay. So here, I'll bring it around to people. Okay. I'm Hector Galato, San Jose, California. I was 28 years old, Vince, when uh, I was working in a little substation in East San Jose, and we did follow what the carriers in New York were doing. Uh, I can't speak for the whole city, but at least our little area there. Uh, yeah, it was tough times. A lot of the housewives were not working. You know, everybody was, the most wives were at home. And then it goes back many years. I, I was making 258 an hour, 248 an hour. And I've talked to carriers, I originally was from branch 214. And I talked to carriers who were actually on welfare and food stamps, and that was a disgrace. But um, getting back to nowadays, uh, a lot of people I talked to, and I'm luckily to be retired, I retired in 92. But uh, a lot of people, a lot of carriers and employees are worried about the five-day, six-day delivery. And I'd appreciate if you could let us know what the update is on that. I just hope there's a post office that's going to be delivering the mail five, six, and seven days a week, if possible. It's a question of the situation in the Postal Service. They're losing mountains of money. They're going to go to the Congress. Congress has deemed, some of them anyway, that one day out of the delivery system would uh, save a lot of money for the postal service. I don't think that'll pass. I don't think, because it's counterproductive to the whole idea. Our respective unions, your union, Medicare's union, APW, are opposed to a change from six days to five days. Um, and we will uh, make our opposition known to the Hall of Congress and the AFL-CIO. Uh, Fred and I have been trying to work on a resolution to get it adopted by the AFL-CIO so we have all of labor on our side. But uh, we oppose it in my union. I oppose it because I think it's a, it's, it will be, be the beginning of the demise of the posters. I believe once you go down that road, 
of reducing your service to satisfy financial needs, then that becomes the model. And if this year it's six to five, then if you have the same financial need next year or five years from now, do you revisit it? Do you go to four? Do you go to three? And my other concern, now this may be even more important than the other, is while the pollsters can receive the authority of the Congress to reduce delivery days, they cannot impose upon the American public that they can't receive mail six days a week. And if the American citizens demand, just in the general marketplace, that they're going to receive mail six days a week, then somebody else will deliver on that sixth day. So uh, I, I oppose it, and I'll do everything I can to defeat it. Let me quickly say that when this was suggested before, uh, and actually had some relative legislative life. It initially was a challenge to stop it from being successful. A lot of members of Congress saw it as a way to save money. Uh, and these were, these were friends of, of, of employees. So we had a Democrat in the White House, Jimmy Carter. We had a chairman of the Postal Committee in the Senate, Abe Ribicoff. And they thought saving money was a good idea. And in those days, they thought it saved about $400 million. Uh, so they actually got the bill out of committee. It came out of the post office committee. And let me tell you something very candidly. We had, uh, under Vince leader, Vince's leadership, I spent a lot of time, obviously, up on the Hill and in the field dealing with this issue, um, immensely important. And one of our challenges, and I'm not being critical, I'm just being honest, were some letter carriers who thought this would give them a weekend. In other words, a similar thing that's going on with health care now is not a total understanding of the impact. And so you had, you had, and you had members of Congress, they said, well, nobody, nobody was going to worry about six-day delivery. You don't get any mail on Saturday, which, of course, is wrong. And you had people out there saying, I get nothing important on Saturday, which is wrong. So our biggest challenge was, frankly, a misunderstanding and ignorance as to the impact. The good news is, under Vince's leadership and, and the leadership of the other unions, when we finally got to the point that this was voted on the floor of the Senate, it was defeated 93 to 4. So it's a tough issue initially if you don't get on it and you don't talk to people and if you don't have a program. George, Brian Hellman. Um, would it be safe to assume that the only reason for that March 12th secret meeting and vote was because they got word that March 17th was being called for the strike in New York City? That's a very good question. Um, up to a point, they believed, that is members of the committee, uh, through briefings that they had from, from people from the administration, uh, that, the, uh, that the pay raise issue was serious. However, they were also divided. Uh, the senator that chaired the committee in the Senate, uh, post office committee, who was referenced, uh, McGee, Senator McGee, he was adamant about the pay raise being separate from any reform legislation. And there was a number of members of Congress who were not enemies, but actually didn't think that this was really necessary at this point. They really believed that the, that the letter carriers and postal clerks uh, you know, were doing all right given the, the nature of their job. They didn't understand their job or the challenge, so there was that problem. And the administration had actually, as I said, held up a pay raise because they thought they could leverage the system. So here's what the committee thought. The committee thought that there was some, as Vince said, uh, was being characterized as a bunch of New York radicals, uh, probably had some affiliation with some of the, uh, you know, the uh, protesters. And they might make some noise or do some picketing, but it wasn't going to move. It wasn't going to become a national problem. But what they wanted to do was have that meeting on March 12th to move quickly to demonstrate that they did care about the system and they wanted to try to change and remedy the problems. But they were all surprised when this thing took off and became as successful as it did. Um, with your permission, Alan, I was researching to prepare for uh, this program today, and I came upon a, a picture of when the, uh, Nixon signed the legislation that flew out, that came out of the strike. And if you, I have 50 copies, so if you'll distribute it to those that are in attendance. Oh, it's got a 
He's out. We accept all presents. <laughs> we accept everything? Oh, be, be wa beware of clerks. Alan, you might want to auction those off. You might want to auction those off. He's suggesting we auction it off. We can do that later. Yes, sir. Yeah, Al Paranto. One of the things that also helped us one of the things that also helped us that, that we should also touch on is that the public support was with us. We had enormous of public support. When we went back to work, I had letters on my mailbox saying, great for you guys, you guys deserve it. People became aware of our plight by the strike and they came out and supported our efforts. And, then they, and that's why I believe we were successful also. Thank you. Well, let me just add one more point. I did it this at a, I pointed this out at a previous meeting, a meeting at the uh, Smithsonian. It's been referenced that the pr President Nixon sent troops into New York to deliver mail. And they tried. They did whatever they could do, which was very, very little. But an interesting note is that six weeks, almost six weeks to the day, after those troops came into New York, a young lady was killed on the campus of Kent State University by a person that was in the National Guard that happened to shoot her. That was the dangerous environment that we were in at that time. Got another question here? Well, more so a comment. Um, I came to the Postal Service in 1980, and I pretty much wanted to thank you all for your service. And um, I couldn't imagine coming into the Postal Service without having unions, and just wanted to say I appreciate what you all have done for us. I'm a Postal Union president now, and I really, really do appreciate having a union. Thank you. I, I will add one note. Um, I mentioned to you in the beginning I was on tour one as a trainee during this period. My brother was in the military and was called up to go to Manhattan to sort mail in processing center. <laughs> and I get a call that evening from my brother and he says, what do you do with a letter for, uh, labeled Puerto Rico? Where does it go? Yeah. I said, uh, uh I think we got a problem. <laughs> Next question. Joe Trenga, and I was on strike uh, in 1970. I, uh, this picture of shows the National Guard. Anybody seen this before? Yeah. And this tells the story of what the National Guard was trying to do. They look very confused. If anybody sees this or anybody wants to look at it, they're welcome to look at it. <laughs> this comes out of the... <laughs> okay. And uh, I do have a film that uh, was given to me by Vince last time with... We had the 25th anniversary, I don't know if you recall, sending me a film about uh, the carrier and how they had to go on welfare and everything. Yes. I do have that film here. If you want to show it today, you're welcome to show it. It's up to you people. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll hopefully bring to me up soon. Okay. Yeah, it's a good time to remind you all that we are having a coffee reception upstairs after the uh, Q&A section. So if you didn't get a chance to share your story at, um, now, you'll have an opportunity to to chat and share all your memories um, upstairs. By the way, I happily call on people to want to donate something to the museum. That's a good way to go priority-wise. So who has the next question? Anybody? Let me yeah. quickly mention that, uh, based on your point, and, and some of the members of Congress were insensitive to the situation. Most were not. They, they didn't understand the impact and actually what was going on with the individual letter carriers. And I'm not being critical of members of Congress, but they, there's 3,000 issues that pass the Congress every year. And so no one's on top of everything. An example of the patronage system really seemed to work from their perspective. I mean, here they, a member of Congress could appoint the rural letter carrier or the postmaster, not only in his district, but in adjoining districts that that was represented by somebody from the other party. So 
you got a lot of what you thought. And, and you'd all pointed out during the debate in the committee, yeah, you, you make one person happy, but you anger 30 other people. And that was rather effective. But even after the Postal Reorganization Act passed, 1970, the, the Speaker McCormick left the, the, the House. He, he was replaced in his district by a man named Joe Moakley, who turned out to be a very good friend of letter carriers. My point of the story was, Moakley called me up as the subcommittee staff director after he got elected, and he said, I want to come by and see you. I said, no, I'll come to your office, Congressman. He said, I got something to talk to you. I went by his office. He said, he said um, the speaker, the former speaker, told me that it was important for me to get on the post office and civil service committee so that I could appoint my letter carriers and my postmaster. And I said, well, Congressman, I have a kind of a bad story. I said, the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 eliminated that option. It's no longer legal. It's no longer in the law for you to do that. And he looked at me and he said, then why the blank blank did I get on this committee? <laughs> so a lot of the members on these two committees were there for the local politics. And from their perspective, they were appointing people. People seemed to be happy. So what was the problem? So let's, let's once again thank the three speakers again for the job. <laughs> While you're standing. While you're standing, also, I want to thank Allison, Allison, Nancy in the back, and Aaron, who's behind you, for putting this program together. We have refreshments upstairs. Uh, if, what you do is you go out and go up the escalator, just walk across the lobby, and you'll see the door will be open. We have uh, refreshments upstairs, and we could all celebrate Dick Barton's birthday. Nin 95 now, right, Dick? 92. 92, okay. Thank you very much for coming. Please come back again.